Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Waste 360's Unpacking Recycling with Charlotte. I am so excited to be here with you today. We are not going to be talking about recycling though, we're going to be talking about composting and compostable packaging. It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I used to focus on compostable packaging back in the day when I was helping companies design more sustainable packaging. And uh, it's a really interesting topic because compostable packaging is growing so quickly and is an area that I think a lot of folks are interested in. It's some of the most common questions that I get on Twitter and Instagram. So I'm really excited to dive into what can compost, you know, what kinds of compostable packaging are out there? Are they the same thing as plant-based packaging and plant-based plastic? Um, you know, how do composting facilities and composting infrastructure work? Um, all of that jazz. So we're just going to dive on in. Um, today, it's really helpful to understand that at a high level, about 60% of the material that we produce, we can compost, but that we do a really pretty bad job of composting it today. So we can compost yard waste, food waste, compostable packaging, a lot of paper, uh, biosolids, which is basically human waste. Um, but unfortunately, about 8 or 9% of what we do generate is composted. Um, so we don't do a great job of it today. Some parts of the country do a spectacular job. All residents and businesses are required to compost and the programs accept food waste and yard waste and compostable packaging. Other parts of the country, you know, the city might not require anyone to do it or provide the service, but composting facilities exist. So if you on your own want to go out and contract with a composter, you can do that and like, you know, start a subscription. In other parts of the city um, and country, uh, you know, you just don't have access to composting facilities and you can't compost through a composter even if you wanted to. So there's a big spectrum. It totally depends on where you live, um, but a lot of programs can accept compostable packaging. It's a minority of composting facilities that are out there. A majority of facilities only accept food and yard waste. Um, folks are sometimes a little ambivalent and anxious to accept compostable packaging because sometimes it doesn't break, da break down as intended. Sometimes they get more contamination than they would otherwise if they accept compostable packaging from folks because someone might throw something into the bin that, you know, isn't compostable but looks like it should be. Um, so it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, but those are a couple of the factors that go into a composting facility deciding whether or not they want to accept compostable packaging. But the reason that we want to compost in the first place is that when something is organic material and is in a landfill, it breaks down in what we call an anaerobic environment, which basically means an environment without oxygen. And when that happens, it generates methane, which is a very harmful greenhouse gas, much more harmful and potent than carbon dioxide. And it's one of the biggest priorities in terms of climate change when thinking about recycling and composting. We want to really pull any material out of landfills that will generate methane. That's really one of the biggest, highest priorities. So beyond that, when compostable packaging is in a landfill, we, we really, you know, if it's paper, it's going to break down. If it's plastic, it's just going to hang out there. You know, no plastic, whether it's compostable or conventional plastic, does anything in a landfill. It's just hanging out there. It's not going to compost and produce a soil amendment. That's one thing that's really important to keep in mind, that if you are using a compostable item, a compostable package, it really needs to get to a composting facility and be composted to produce compost. It's not going to do anything if it's in a landfill. So when you think about, you know, if you are deciding what food service where to buy for your picnic or barbecue this weekend, um, and you're thinking about, you know, do I want to buy compostable packaging? Do I want to buy regular plates and utensils? Um, and you don't have a composter, you can't compost it. Maybe just pick the conventional material because the compostable packaging in a landfill is not going to be doing anything special and composting and breaking down into valuable soil amendment. Um, so that's really important to understand from the get-go. One of the most common questions I get is about pet waste in those compostable or biodegradable bags um, and, you know, whether that's going into a landfill and composting, and the answer is no. Nothing composts in a landfill. So, you know, probably doesn't make the most sense to use those items if you, you know, uh, or just use them being, being aware that they're not going to be composting and breaking down in a landfill. So that starts to touch on some of the claims about biodegradability and compostability. If they're the same thing, what do they mean? Basically, biodegradability is kind of the big universe of stuff that can break down relatively quickly into organic biological components. So um, that's an unscientific answer, but basically I think all one needs to know, and composting is a subset of that. So we know that something that's biodegradable doesn't necessarily mean it's compostable. It's kind of like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, if that makes sense. 
So we definitely don't want to be composting something if it's labeled biodegradable because that does not mean that it can compost. It doesn't mean that it's going to break down in a composting facility and in a composting environment, you know, whether it's your small home composting pile in your garden or a big huge commercial scale composting facility. So that's another item that's important to think about is where is the compostable item going? And that, you know, impacts whether it can be composted or not. So uh, something like a molded fiber egg carton. This is something that you might kind of, you know, rip up and use in your garden composting pile, in your home composting pile, or at a community scale composting operation, maybe at your local urban farm or community garden. This doesn't have complex compostable plastics or adhesives or inks or coatings that would make it challenging to compost and break down, this is probably going to work just fine. Same thing for stuff like paper towels or napkins. Those are really easy for folks to compost, kind of regardless of where you are. Um, coffee filters, tea bags, as long as they don't have staples, are also kind of easily compostable items that most composting programs can accept. Um, when you get into uncoated paper products or coated paper product products with compostable plastic, then you kind of get into the territory of wanting something to be certified compostable to really demonstrate that it can break down in a composting facility in a composting process. You also get into the territory where it's probably not something you want to be putting into your home composting pile if you have one and wanting to be directing to a professionally managed commercial scale composting facility. Same goes for compostable plastic. So generally speaking, those items really need a big commercial scale facility to process. And the reason is pretty simple. It's that simply it's more hot and your home composting pile physically because it's smaller, the microbial activity isn't as robust and it's not going to get as hot. Those complex structures like compostable plastics really aren't going to generally be able to break down. In a commercial scale composting facility, they have what's called windrows, those long rows of kind of black earth and soil that you know compostable material is folded into and composted in and those are really enormous they're much bigger than me whenever i've been to a composting facility they usually are towering three four five feet above me they're also really hot and that's because they're enormous so they have incredibly robust microbial activity breaking down material whether it's food waste and yard waste or compostable packaging it's really hot you can tell you can be several feet away from it and the pile is just you know, roaring, rearing with heat. So we know that those environments are much better at breaking down compostable plastics and, you know, more challenging, difficult materials. But it, you know, it kind of also depends on the given package. So the, the testing standards that are out there, there's two testing standards, two ASTM standards, D6400 and 6868, one for compostable plastic, one for compostable paper. And they're both really similar. They bas basically test that nothing has uh, heavy metals or adhesives or inks that might compromise or kind of, you know, chemically harm the, the end product. Um, they also identify um, whether or not a product is physically breaking down into small enough pieces fast enough. So by 90 days, um, you know, really everything has to be broken down kind of between uh, below two millimeters in terms of a size threshold, kind of, you know, identifying and measuring that physical disintegration of the material. And then there's, of course, kind of the biological conversion of carbon. So at least 90% of carbon within 180 days needs to be able to break down to be able to call a compostable package compostable. So that is something that's pretty hard to do and to design to. And it also is challenging because each composter's facility works a little bit differently. So some composting facilities run in three, four week intervals and they can't you know, run their process long enough to accommodate compostable packaging. So if your composting facility doesn't want compostable packaging or doesn't want compostable plastics, even if it's certified compostable, that might be why that their system is just really quick. So it can't take long enough to let those complex structures break down. Other composting facilities run for two, three months. They can more easily accommodate compostable plastic and they don't have as big of an issue processing it, but it totally depends. So that's something to be mindful of that not every composting program is gonna want or gonna be able to handle compostable packaging well for that reason. Um, when we also think about composting standards and certifications, we really be, you know, want to be mindful that not only are they really for commercial scale facilities, there is a home composting certification out there for compostable packaging, but it's really rare. You don't see it very often out in the marketplace. Um, so do that at your own risk in your home composting pile, but uh, it's for commercial scale facilities and it's also sometimes really hard to tell from the item itself. So let's say you have a compostable or what you think is a compostable plate. It might not say on the plate itself, you know, compost me. It might not have a BPI certification logo. BPI is the North American standard for, uh, I'm sorry, standard as in like the, you know, excellent program that we have. Um, 
uh, so it might not have a BPI logo, you can go to BPI's website and take a look at an inventory of certified compostable products, which is really helpful. So if you want to stock up ahead of summer barbecues and picnics, you know, go there, make sure you're buying certified compostable materials. It is the best source to be able to, you know, vet for sure that what you're buying will be accepted by programs that, you know, want certified compostable packaging. The real value add for composters in accepting compostable packaging and kind of putting up with the longer time it takes to break down and the bigger risk of contamination is that compostable packaging can do a really good job of, you know, kind of ferrying food waste with it. So if you are, you know, hosting a barbecue, paper plates are going to be wet and food soiled, that's going to add really valuable nutrients into a composter's process. A compostable paper plate or a compostable plastic cup on its own really isn't an enticing feedstock for a composter. It's not adding a lot of nutrients or moisture or value to their process. And really importantly, composters think of themselves as compost manufacturers. They do not think of themselves as waste disposers. So while us residents really want to compost material, get it out of landfills, do the best job we can, composters are really dead set. Their first priority is to create high quality soil amendment and a high quality compost is a product, you know, to, to go back into gardens and urban, you know, organic farms, you name it. Uh, lots of different applications for compost, not just those. But uh, that's a really helpful thing to keep in mind, that kind of the, you know, mental shift that takes place when between a city or a state running a composting program, wanting to get stuff out of landfill, dispose of organic waste, you know, responsibly versus a composter that really wants to produce high quality compost. Those are two different goals and there's overlap and they support each other in a lot of ways, but there is some friction there just to kind of keep in mind. Um, but that is one of the reasons why composters really want compostable packaging that's going to take in food and moisture with it. You know, they wouldn't be interested usually in taking a whole load of compostable packaging that just doesn't have anything else going on. So for that reason, when you think about what, you know, what product is compostable packaging a good fit for, you know, every once in a while, I saw yesterday uh, an ad for a compostable hair clip. And um, there's some compostable shoes out on the market. Um, I saw like compostable wallpaper a few weeks ago. Those aren't items that composters really want. And one of the challenging things about those is that because, you know, maybe there's one company that sells them, but 99.9% .9 of the products on the marketplace aren't. If someone sees a compostable shoe, if a composter sees a compostable shoe come into their process, into their, you know, composting facility, they're going to yank it out of the compost pile thinking it's a normal shoe. So that's one thing to keep in mind that even if a product, a wacky product says it's compostable, it might not get through the composting process and it might not make sense to put in your compost bin because genuinely, you know, a composter is just going to see it and think it's contamination. So that's helpful to keep in mind. One other thing that I definitely want to talk through is compostable plastic and plant based plastic and how that relates to each other. So compostable plastic and plant based plastic are not synonymous interchangeable terms, although you often see them used that way. But that is something that I really hope to, you know, to do my part in fixing and encourage everyone to, to kind of use precisely and clearly. A lot of plant based plastic can be made into compostable plastic. Um, you can also take plant based inputs and make conventional recyclable plastic. So you can make a recyclable PET soda bottle from corn or sugar. You can make a compostable cup made from corn and sugar. It just depends on the kind of chemical processes and engineering that you want to do to it. So it's not one and the same. Sometimes you see a sign that says, you know, we accept plant based plastics in this compost bin. And that claim is pretty misleading because they can't. Sometimes plant-based plastics are conventional plastic. So you want to be really mindful of those claims. They don't necessarily mean the other thing. And conversely, you can have compostable plastics that are made from fossil-based inputs, which is confusing and takes some time to sink in. But the, the main kind of compostable plastic we see on the market today is plant-based. Um, it's called PLA, polylactic acid, and has a number seven resin identification code. So if you see a cup with a number seven on it, good chance that it's compostable. Um, a number seven doesn't mean it's certified compostable or anything like that. It's a catch-all category for lots of kinds of plastics that aren't one through six, which is a weird thing. Um, but if it has a number seven, it generally means if you're in a restaurant, you know, that it's made of PLA and is likely compostable. Um, that is generally made in the U.S. from corn. So you can make it out of sugar, potato starch, corn, lots of different plant-based inputs. In the U.S., we have a lot of corn, so that's what goes into our compostable rigid plastics most often. 
Um, and the trade offs there are important to think through. So it doesn't necessarily mean this is made from plants. This is automatically more sustainable. Um, it means that it's made from plants and it has a different supply chain. So it's not fossil based, but it has a ton of water and a ton of synthetic fertilizers that went into it instead. So we know that a rigid PLA compostable cup, you know, has a GHG emissions profile that's much lower compared to that conventional fossil based alternative, um, about 80% less greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. But conversely, there's like a six, seven fold increase in water use and an even higher increase in aquatic toxicity because of those synthetic fertilizers. So, you know, there's trade offs. It doesn't mean that it's automatically more sustainable. That's why we don't want to automatically have every package be compostable or all plastic be compostable plastic, because, you know, first off, we know that composters don't want it for every material. They want it for packaging that will bring them food waste or moisture. Um, and we also know that there's just inherently trade offs. For the other side, for plastic that might be, you know, compostable, but made of fossil based inputs, which is weird and counterintuitive. Um, typically, we see that coming up in in plastic compostable bags. So some compostable bags can be made from plant based inputs, but some are made from fossil based inputs. So the kind of plastic that you might see a compostable bag made from that's fossil based is called PBAT, which stands for polybutane diol which is a mouthful, but it genuinely composts and breaks down both physically and chemically into carbon and organic components, just like a plant-based compostable plastic would. So it has, you know, absolutely the same ability to break down and be beneficial to the soil amendment a composter is making um, 100%. It is just weird that we can do that and chemically engineer plastic to be made from fossil fuels and kind of be, you know, processed into something that's genuinely compostable, which is really cool, but kind of funky and counterintuitive. Um, so helpful to keep in mind that just because it's plant based doesn't mean it's compostable. Likewise, just because it's compostable doesn't mean it's plant based. Um, but I would love to dive into the topic of bio based plastics in and of themselves, you know, on its own during an episode soon. Uh, but I would love to know and hear feedback on what you all think of compostable packaging. Is it what you expected? Do you have compostable packaging in your life today? Do you compost it? Do you put it in the trash? Do you recycle the paper instead of composting? Um, please give me a shout and let me know what you think and what questions you have at uh, Char Dreisen on Twitter, C-H-A-R-D-R-E-I-Z-E-N um, on Twitter and Char Recycles on Instagram at C-H-A-R Recycles. I would be delighted to know and follow up with any questions that this might have prompted. Um, I'm sure there might be some, but thank you again for joining for another week's episode of Waste 360's Unpacking Recycling with Charlotte. It was great to talk to you not about recycling today, but about composting and compostable packaging.